Golf is the, the only thing in golf that doesn't change. The only thing that changes is the person playing. Is this man a one-time winner on the PGA Tour? The point, Alan, is he didn't go Hollywood. You need a fourth? Well, Michael, uh, this is the, the point in the program where we always tip our caps to our corporate sponsors, Echo, who are the purveyors of very stylish and comfortable footwear that I know you're a fan of, as am I. Um, I feel like you have someone you want to say here. Jump in, please. You know, I actually enjoy this part. <laughs> Against all odds. But you don't want to ask me the question I've teed up for you? Oh, yes. You you, you want to discuss laces? Laces, am I right? true laces, yes. I think yeah. part uh, – thank you for reminding me. Um, I think part of a quality product, no matter what the product is, whether it's a Mercedes Benz or, or an Echo uh, golf shoe, um, attention to detail is always paid. Uh, our guest today, uh, Sean Foley, is from Orlando. Orlando is a longtime home of Arnold Palmer. I drop Arnold Palmer's name way too often, but also at every opportunity I can. And one of Arnold's things was before every tournament, put in a new pair of laces because you don't want to be like Saturday morning and the lace breaks. And like, oh, I got a lot of other things on my mind. I really don't want to be putting in new laces. So he put new laces every week. I think that every time, by the way, every time I wear golf shoes, it's only Echo shoes because those are the only shoes I own. Um, but I think of the quality of the Echo lace and the fact that I don't need to change them every week. I don't need to change them ever. They seem to, I don't know what they've done right but they do the two things you want. They don't break and they stay tied. Have you had a, and I've noted your echo shoes. You've got a different one. You've got a, you've got a, a, a wide flat lace. I've got more of a, a knotted kind of lace, but it's got a cotton quality to it that holds its grip. If that's a term of the art. I'm inspired by the, the care and the thought you've put into the laces. And um, I may not share it, but all I know is I put my echo shoes on. They work. They stick to me to the ground during my incredibly fast swing speed, and they're comfy and they look good. And um, so, thank you, Echo. Back to Nita Fourth. Well, uh, Jeff, Michael, I'm very excited about our guest today. Uh, he is one of the preeminent swing coaches on the planet. Has taken both a male and female player to world number one. Um, it's not Butch Harmon or David Ledbetter. Any any guesses? Very well groomed individual, I believe. Oh, okay, yes, that's an excellent <laughs> guess. Yes, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give Jeff the. Uh, does it trigger anything for you, Jeff? So far, Canadian, maybe. Oh, he's Canadian. Yes. Yeah. So oh, you guys are good, man. You're too good. All right, Sean Foley, come on down. Show thyself. The unveil. <laughs> <laughs> Very well groomed indeed. Look at that. I, I mean, I've been out on I've been out on the course there uh, since about eight a.m. So, and not I a hair out of place. It, it's I impressive. love what you've done with the place, Sean. Thank you. Where are you? I'm in Orlando in uh, Windermere. Sean, have you ever seen the movie Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Yes. With George Clooney, and you know the hair pomade is an important part of the plot. So, uh, do you use Dapper Dan as well? What, what's your product of choice? Uh, I, I'd have to ask my wife what she gets me. I don't even remember the name of it. <laughs> okay. We basically do. We do. We, I'm almost halfway to a tour player, Jeff. Now, because uh, between my manager and my wife, uh, I actually don't ever have to make a decision or do anything myself. So it's good. <laughs> Isn't it great? Yeah, it, it is great, but it is also. When you're in an airport and you don't know how to rent your own car, that's kind of embarrassing. So, <laughs> uh, it's, Well, you're living the dream, Sean. Uh, I, I thought we would start with something easy and low pressure. I want you to tell us what you like most about Jeff Ogilvie's golf swing and if there's anything you'd want to tinker with. The, the floor is yours. Yeah, I mean, it's been a minute since I've seen it. When I used to see it all the time, it was working pretty good. I mean, if you don't like hitting four irons straight up into the sky. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, when you have great players like Jeff or anybody, I think a lot of guys swing start to, they, they, they kind of adapt around the surface that players play off of. And so it's like when you come to Florida here and it's super grainy and really sandy, a lot of guys really lean the shaft hard and trap the ball. But I think when you go to certain other parts, like a lot of guys from Australia are really good pickers. Now they still play in the wind, but I think a lot of the surfaces that you could grow up on at the good courses in Australia, it's going to be pretty firm and quick. So I think some of that changes it. But then also, no, Jeff, one of my original friends on the PGA Tour, 
uh, was Dale Lynch, who was Jeff's coach, like forever and ever and ever. So, you know, he had, he, he had a lot of time in his backswing, released the club really nice, kind of emulated his pitching motion uh, around the green and, you know, where he's known for one of the most famous pitch shots in the history of a major championship. But uh, yeah, I'm sure he hated his swing, but I, I, I liked his ball flight. And, and that's really what it comes down to is that, you know, because we're human beings and in our DNA, there's vanity based on tribal acceptance and stuff. We're more concerned sometimes about how something looks than how it works. And I definitely, in the, in the past, I fell victim to that as a coach, uh, rather than looking at how someone's hitting the ball. So I think, you know, you listen to commentators say there's a thousand ways to swing a club. There really is not a thousand ways to swing a club. And I think what there's probably about three different types of profiles. It's just everyone doing it looks so different that it ends up looking different. But I think if you understand that, like basically it's how I try to think about it is that I'm a tailor and I provide, you know, this incredible wool, but how everyone's suit gets made is going to be slightly different, but it doesn't mean that the wool's not identical. So when you look at the dynamics of what make things happen in the swing, as far as the body and then as far as the physics with the club, and then the geometry of a flat surface hitting a round object, everyone's suit looks slightly different, but inherently the dynamics are identical. Very interesting. Uh, you've, you've always been, uh, Sean, a very, very cerebral person and teacher. What has been your own learning process been like through all these years of, of teaching? I guess you just keep trying to get down to the root of things um, and just trying to get down to the root of human movement. So. For, for me, I grew up looking at a lot of videos. I grew up, my first coach was in the golfing machine, um, which, you know, has kind of come and gone and come and gone and then came again with Bryson DeChambeau. Um, but really, that was kind of the first book that had any kind of empirical understanding of golf. I was always taught golf's a game of feel. It's about rhythm. And it is about that. But you can't really tell a 20 handicap that that's the case because the reason that world-class players have such good rhythm is because the force they're putting into the club and the force they're putting into the ground, they're just so congruent and they serenade one another so it looks like there's rhythm. Like telling someone who has the face open coming down to finish in balance, they're not going to finish in balance because they're going to put a late torque on the club to close it or use the body to come over the top. So. Things like rhythm and balance, they're kind of the effects of other things that have happened. So, uh, you know, I never really thought 25 years ago that I would have sat in the office of so many PhDs when I first started coaching. But it just felt like when I listened to the great coaches in the world and I read all these articles in golf magazines, you know, some said, get your elbow like this. And some said, get your elbow like this. And some said, you know make sure your grip's like this, or you can't play like this. And if your grip's like this, you won't be able to play. And then I used to work at the Canadian Open as a kid. Uh, I worked on the range. And so I would, was so uh, I was so into it and was so observant that I started looking at a bunch of guys doing things that you weren't allowed to do and be incredibly successful at it. And so it, it just, you know, it, it's, it's, it's humanity, right? We fall into this spectrum of indoctrination and domestication and then acceptance. And so, you know, like the education system we have, no one is being taught to be free thinkers. It's going to really work for the system if we're just robot, right? And so create this base set of beliefs, live within those beliefs. If we challenge those beliefs, get attacked by everyone who believes it. And so it's not really that much different, is it? Like everything is the same from, you know, I mean, like people like uh, Isaac Newton, I mean, he was brandished as crazy until people realized that he was right. So I think, you know, as I've been out on tour, was one of the first people to use a track man, all of those things, um, that brought with it its own criticism uh, and using high speed cameras. And I guess at the end of the day, if I go into the ER, I want them to measure what they want to guess and they will measure it. And so of course, the ER doctor has a lot of experience and he knows with what I'm telling him my symptoms are. It's probably one of three things, but it can also be a thousand things. But within his experience, it's within three. 
But that doesn't mean that he doesn't have me take an x-ray or do an MRI or do a CAT scan. So he probably knows the signs of a concussion, but he's also going to check it to make sure that he's, that he's correct. So, you know, that's the difference now is if you look at the great swings from the 50s, there's still swings like that today. Of course, the technology's changed a little bit um, to where the ball launches higher and doesn't spin as much. So obviously, when you look at the great players, you know, Darwin is right. Their ability to adapt to their environment is just at a higher level than most. Um, so that's maybe slightly different. But how Jack, Nich- how Jack Nicholas developed power back in the day and how Bryson learned to is no different. It's no different. So. Um, Cameron Champ has the fastest club head speed. That's because he has the fastest hand speed. When I was a kid, they said if you had fast hips, you'd hit it far. But I teach a bunch of junior golfers whose hips point left of the targeted impact and they don't hit the ball that far because their hands aren't moving that fast. So even, even in the deep dive into the science, it still brings us back to the fact that, you know, Jack Nicholas and Tiger Woods, when they talk, they talk about their hands and their grip and what they're doing with their hands and arms. So I was being taught to lag the club as much as I could. And I'm listening to Nicholas and Greg Norman at the Canadian Open talk about how they can't release the club early enough from the top. I'm like, what does that even mean? So there's a big difference between something lagging behind you and then you dragging it behind you. So um, just, you know... Growing up and them teaching me about this perfect swing plane, now I'm at the Canadian Open and I'm watching Lee Trevino and Jim Furyk and a young Sergio Garcia. And I'm like, what is this swing plane people are talking about? I'm not seeing it. So when you dive more into physics, you understand why all those kind of loop under moves ended up being very efficient because you're dealing with angular momentum. So it's no different than anything in gravity. Like, for example, a, a water skier is going behind a boat at 40 miles an hour and the boat's going 40 miles an hour. As soon as the boat starts to slow down and arc, the water skier gets thrown outside the wake. So technically you have to get the skier behind the boat. And then we were all told to put the club in front of us. And that ruined a lot of backs and necks and a lot of impact positions. So it's, uh, I think where Jeff was kind of lucky was that it wasn't, oh, it wasn't massively a method um, that the guys were being coached. But I think if you look back to that time, to, to me, you can watch players do the same drills and their swings all look quite a bit different. And then you can watch players do different drills and their swing looking the same. And that's always an indicator that someone doesn't really know what they're doing because there's going to be nuances um, in, in, in how people move. So when people look at like a Cameron Champ, and they're like, man, how does he do that? Cameron is incredibly naturally strong and incredibly naturally mobile. I mean, this guy doesn't work out. He doesn't stretch. And he can move into any position the body needs to move in. And a kid who doesn't work out can do 22 wide grip pull-ups without even trying. So what happens is people see what Cameron's doing and they try to match that, but they don't have the understanding below at really how much of a unicorn that he is and that guys like him are typically in Aussie rules football or UF's football or you know what I'm saying? They weren't really golfers. So I think when we see these young players today, like Joaquin Neiman, Cameron Champ, uh, Mito Pereira, Victor Hovland, they're doing the same things that everyone else is doing. They just have the ability to do some of the things that look different and somehow don't hurt their back doing it. So if you look in, for example, in baseball, you'll, you'll see how many, how many pitchers in the draft are sidearm pitchers. Well, no one teaches people how to throw, uh, you know, sidearm. But a kid picks up the ball and just starts throwing sidearm. Well, in most cases, if you change him to doing this, he's probably going to be done, right? So... It's, it's unique that he generates a lot of energy from sidearm versus from here. The mechanics of this says that the ball will move faster and you'd have more accuracy. But like, I think one of the greatest coaching testaments to coaching ever is Mike Furyk, like Jim Furyk's dad. He just let Jim keep swinging the way that he was swinging. And I think if you look at Jim kind of from rib cage to rib cage, 
I mean, that's what so many people are trying to emulate, right? Being able to bend and rotate and not have to use your hands as much. But I mean, Furek just did an incredible job to block everyone out and keep doing gym. So I think, I think my knowledge has grown so much. But in that, like I've never, I know more than I ever have, which leads me to believe that I don't really know a whole lot because I keep learning it. So if someone comes to me 20 years ago and they're hitting the ball well, but I kind of don't like something I'm seeing, I'm still domesticated in my methodology and my belief system. And so I try to make it look more like I think it should. Whereas now, if I have a young man or young woman come to me and they hit the ball great and they have no injuries or anything lingering from it, um, there's so many things to teach them. Like most of these kids don't even understand the importance of breathing and its effect on the nervous system. So they're sitting with sports psychologists who are trying to get them to have better thinking where when they play their best, they're clear. So it's not really about better thinking, is it? It's about less thinking. And how can I get to a point where I wind that down? Well, if I learn to breathe properly, um, then I'm able to do that. So the difference is there's a change to the nervous system. So back in the day, for me, that would have been like a positive talk or have a better attitude on the course or have a better mindset. But whenever my attitude is good or my mindset is good, I've done nothing to ask for it. I'm just there. Like that's just where I'm at. So When I'm in a good mood, I can't put my finger on why I'm in a good mood. People will say, well, your players are playing good. You got a great wife and you got great kids and you've been successful. Well, all that shit's true on my worst day. So life is an inside job. It can't come from outside of me. So trying to get these kids now to understand like the answers are already inside of you. It's my job to ask the right questions. And if if the kid is as hungry and obsessed, they will come to it. They'll 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 sort it out, but I think the environment has a huge aspect on how people learn to swing the golf club if they're passionate and curious. And then the next step of success is obviously sacrifice. Well, this was the Need a Fourth podcast. Thank you for listening, and uh, <laughs> thanks to Sean Foley. I'm just kidding. We're going to keep going, but uh, that was that was an amazing answer. Uh, you touched on so many things, um, but you know, it, obviously. Your 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 time as a kid, as a fan at the Canadian Open was was monumental in, in your in your journey. And I, I don't know if this is apocryphal or if this is true, but you're at the range at the Canadian Open as a kid and you're watching David Ledbetter work with Nick Faldo. And as the story goes, that that's when you decide you want to be a swing coach. And um, is, is there a kernel of truth in that tale? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I don't think I said right then, like, I'm going to go and work with a bunch of psychopaths for the rest of my life. <laughs> But it, it was uh, um, it was just really cool to see. And then, you know, my first coach was Greg McCatton, who's like at the hierarchy of the golf machine. And then my, I was really lucky that my dad was really careful on who he put me around as men because he understood like 13 or 14, boys kind of tend to stop listening to their dad. But if you can find like-minded other guys, like, for example, my son's personal trainer that he works out with, I mean, if I call him and say, hey, can you talk to him about listening to his mom and being organized? I mean, Quinn's all over it, right? Because this guy's a god to him. And so my dad just put me around excellent mentors. So I went from the golfing machine to Shaughnessy in Vancouver, where Jack McLaughlin was the the head pro. And Jack McLaughlin was kind of the Western, you know, at the the goat of of the Canadian PGA on the West. And he worked with quite a few tour players, Dick Zogel, Lori Kane, Brent Franklin. That's a name from the past, Jeff. He's a little older than us. Um, and Ray Stewart. And so I used to sit on a wire basket. But what he would do is he'd have guys like take their shoes off and hit, you know, 206 irons out of a fairway bunker. So I went from angles and planes and all this to now watching someone create like a completely different experience and realize that it was really about both. And then when we moved back to Toronto the next year, uh, my dad got me a job fixing divots at the National Golf Club in Woodbridge, which is like probably the hardest, best golf course in Canada. And so Ben was the first Canadian to be a first team All-American in college in New Mexico State, was sponsored onto the PGA Tour by Lee Trevino, uh, and then became a disciple and best friend of George Knudsen. And Knudsen's like the Hogan of Canada, right? The only difference is he had like a bit of a sling draw and Hogan didn't draw it as much. 
Um, but he didn't even cut it that much either. So uh, I just was around these guys who had these jobs that looked fantastic. They looked a lot happier than the people who lived in my neighborhood. Um, you know, they were revered and respected. They got to spend the whole day at a golf course, work with all these great players. So really from the time I'm like, probably 14 until I go to college at 19, my, you know, six months of my year is spent on a range with tour players, either practicing or watching them practice. So it's like, it's a species that I understand very, very well. Um, And they were like gods to me. And so I kind of, I saw what to do, what not to do. You know, I mean, that was the first time as a kid is seeing a guy playing his best golf, change his equipment, and then him playing like shit and going, why did he do that? But, um, you know, there's some really good books out there on self-sabotage, but I'm not really academically at the point to where I can explain it yet, but it's a real thing. <laughs> Alan, can I pose a question to Jeff that will, uh, of course. That, that I know Sean will be interested in as well. Jeff, when, when you got on tour and there's a lot of swing coaches out there, how did you know who you might fit up, who you might match with in a, in a good way. And how did that process work for you? Well, I mean, I was fortunate as Sean said, I mean, I had Dale from 15 or 16. Um, so I was never really looking. Um, I was a bit, I'm a bit like probably a lot of people, Sean coaches um, were all quite stubborn, I think. And I knew all the answers. You know, so I kind of, Lynchy was there to confirm my beliefs, <laughs> if you like, in my did, head at least. Did he know that? Um, oh, yeah. Um, I think that's part of the job, isn't it, Sean? But um, well, there's a real dichotomy, right? Because te- technically, I'm not talking about you as a human being, but I'm talking about you as a businessman. Um, and not, so, you're, I don't know if you're the best example of this because of you and Lynchy's like the longevity that you had uh, together. But it's like a job where you have to be incredibly loyal, right? You almost got to put your players ahead of your family when you're trying to really make a name for yourself. But you're historically working with people who are incredibly disloyal. So there's always going to be a dichotomy in, in the thing. As soon as they think it's not something for them, then they're out. And, th- and that's, that's part of it. So, I mean, I've watched a lot of coaches lose their mind out there because they just can't accept that it's a business and that it's not personal. Um, and unfortunately, we spend a lot of time. Well, fortunately and unfortunately, we spend a lot of time around each other. So when it comes time to split up, it's always a bit, you know, it's all it's almost like a breakup in a normal relationship. But I know the players that I can't. I've done a good job of. I've helped a couple guys. I won't name names, but I've helped a couple people build their stables of players on tour from players who called me, um, and I just didn't think that I'd be the right fit for them because I think at the end of my career. I won't really look in the mirror and think about how many players I helped, but I will think about how many I didn't hurt. And uh, I've done it before one time and it's a fucking, it's an awful feeling. And, you know, the thing, this is pretty complex. It's not rocket science, but it's definitely science. And I think today with the information we have out there and the proof, no one should not know that anymore. And I mean, you look in Florida at the top 20 teachers, most of them are charging you know, as much money as corporate lawyers are in Manhattan. And then, you know, to be that corporate lawyer, you got to do your undergrad, then you got to go to law school, and then you normally have to junior under someone. So by the time you're making money as a lawyer, you're 10 years into your education. And a lot of coaches, you know, not so much today, but definitely back in the day were players who didn't make it, who then just became coaches. And um, just, just so much opinion. Like when I go to a nutritionist, I don't want that nutritionist opinion on what I should do. I want, if there's going to be an opinion at all, it's got to come from experience. And I think that, you know, with today's day and age, like my kids are what, 14, 11, and they'll say to me like, yeah, man, that's facts, you know? And it's like, I never had to say that as a kid because we just, we just were under the idea that it was actually a fact, but there's so much misinformation involved. As far as politically, well, there's as much misinformation. So, you know, Instagram and social media is like Gutenberg on steroids, right? I mean, this is the printing press to the full extent. So um, there's a lot of good stuff, but then there's a lot of, then there's a lot of garbage. And, you know, 
it's just amazing to see the careers and success that people can have when they don't really understand one, how humans communicate, two, just the processes of the brain, three, the physics of the club, four, the kinetics and physiology of the body, five, what the ball does in the air and based on wind and temperature. Like I work with guys now and I'll say, all right, so it's going to be 52 degrees when you play. Do you know how far these are? And they don't know that. And it's like, that's so easily measured. And I just think that, sure, there's guys like Jeff and Tiger who are at the highest level. They had the, they picked up these subconscious nuances in certain things, but not everyone's going to find that that way, right? Like, for example, if someone is, if someone is low in angular acuity, which is a cognitive skill, then they either need a caddy who can read putts or they need to learn aim point because they can't see shapes in space. So rather than him end up going through four sports psychologists thinking that it's mental, he can't see shapes in space. Let's start with that first. So those are all things, Alan, that I never thought I was ever going to learn in my life. But it's tricky because look, when people are playing well, when Justin Rose gets the number one, when Tiger Woods wasn't playing good, it didn't matter when Tiger started playing better as he should have, because he's just Tiger. I don't think it would matter who was next to him. Then all of a sudden my inbox and emails are blowing up. Rosie gets the number one. I say no to like 10 people in the next month. Rosie fires me. It's crickets. So I understood a long time ago that I understood a long time ago that I'm only as good as my players are, whether that's a true, whether that, is a true indication of my skill and my understanding. It doesn't really matter. That's just the name of the game. So people play well, you have the potential to get busier. People don't play well. It's just, it, it just kind of goes like this and that's what it is. And I think that, that, uh, as much as I love it and, and love doing it, um, you know, kind of the boring part of love is acceptance. And I have to constantly remind myself, um, that I'm here to keep the main thing about the main thing, coach the player. I think I know in my head what's better for the player as far as his treatment of people, how he could eat, how he could sleep and be off his phone earlier. But, you know, I got a coach who's in front of me without judgment and without prejudice. And it's, uh, it's so challenging. I just, I love it. because It's fucking impossible. I mean, you're obviously a very progressive guy, Sean, um, and, and you've lived it. We all know golf has a very conservative streak um, in the age of Trump and now the Saudi encroachment. It, um, it's been harder to ignore some of the political overtones to what's happening. How do you make peace with with um, your workplace, which a lot of your your colleagues and a lot of probably the players you work with are coming from a very different perspective and, and life experience? Yeah, well, I think it's like if you look at understanding say it's an equation, right? So knowledge plus wisdom equals understanding. So I think if everyone had had my experience, they would probably see things. So that, that reminds me of that, like to point fingers and say, you're, you're wrong and you're wrong and you're wrong. That's not doing anything to bring us closer to one another, right? So it's like, for example, the drive to survive about the Formula One, right? I'd never seen a Formula One race in my life, didn't even care to. My wife and I watch that on Netflix and now I have like my favorite drivers and I watch every race that I record. So as soon as I finally understood what the thing was, all of a sudden I was interested in it. So I think that there's not a Palestinian kid. There's not a Palestinian kid in the West Bank who got to his own natural place about Israelis and vice versa. That shit's all taught. It's all taught. There's no three-year-old in the world. Three-year-old in the world might not want to share his toy with you. But that's because it's in its primate brain and it's not going to do that. But at the end of the day, they're not going to have any issue with like hatred is taught. It, like it's completely taught. So I think just reminding myself that um, I think it was Mandela when they asked him a question like this, but on a way huger level, um, he said it helped him to remind himself that everyone was doing their best from their own level of understanding. So. My job ultimately is to try to find a way to say, hey, you know what? What you have to say is not accurate, but telling someone your opinions don't matter versus my facts. I mean, they, they did a study. I, I don't remember what the school was, but they did a study on conspiracy, on conspiracy theories. And they basically said, if you want to help change someone's idea on something, 
you almost have to interview them. And so if, if, if you believe something, Alan, and I start screaming at you and saying, that's bullshit, that's ridiculous. When they have a functional MRI on, the region where this thought would be held actually fires at a higher impulse. So all I'm doing by challenging you in the wrong way is I'm just increasing your belief system. Okay. So I think it's, I think it's about that. So look, if I was, I grew up in Toronto, my dad's Scottish, my mom is Guyanese. I went from Toronto to Delaware, to San Fran, to LA, to Toronto, to Vancouver, back to Toronto, to Nashville. And then in that time, we went all over the world. And you know, what did Mark Twain say, right? Travel is the venom to bigotry. So I don't know how I could have ended up with my parents, one, what they taught me, and then two, the experience and the environments I observed, I don't think I could have ever been like that, even though I think it feels wrong. Like a guy in the neighborhood was talking about this the other day and, and he said, uh, you know, people still complain about this and that, but slavery was 400 years ago. Um, slavery was what, 400 years ago. And then he, he, the, the comment that he made was, that's just what people thought then. And I corrected him and said, no, there was actually abolitionists back then too who thought it was really inhumane. So, but it's not just an American thing. It's an England thing. It's a France thing. It's an Egypt thing. It's a, every single empire built its structure off the back of obviously slaves. So it's not just that, but I just think America is such an unbelievable country uh, and such a fantastic place that we should challenge ourselves to do better. But you know, you get back into just early understanding of the brain. The brain's goal is to survive. It, it isn't necessarily to thrive. That's the new brain. The old brain's more powerful. So people want to be accepted by a tribe. So once again, we're seeing it with Trump right now. He's kind of on his way out. Guys are starting to go, God, I can't believe he hung out with Kanye West and that other guy. But at one point, there was fine people on both sides. And, 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 but while it was working for the system and the machine, they were like, keep him talking. Now it looks like, oh shit, he's definitely going to lose. And so now they're just pushing him out and they're coming a little bit back more to moderate where these crazy things that these human beings were being, were saying like crazy stuff. And I don't mean like differing from my opinion. I'm just saying crazy things that actually have no factual relevance whatsoever. Uh, now where they're coming a little bit back from psycho and hopefully that's the case because it's like none of those guys say anything they believe. They don't believe that. They just know that that's going to get them votes because there's a bunch of people out there who didn't really shift with the paradigm. And so, yeah, the jobs their grandfather had was helping them raise a family and put their parents through college, but those jobs don't exist anymore. And that's not because of minorities. That's not because of immigrants. It's not because of any of that. It's because of globalization. So it's, I try to just educate people as I can, but just have love for everybody because everyone is just kind of a product of their environment, a product of the books they've read and a product of their experiences. So I don't think anyone wants to feel like that. It doesn't feel good to have animosity towards someone else. I don't even think it's really that natural. So, you know, just trying to, you know, you got to put your arm around people and, and, and try and try and help them to see it. But I just have to be an example of, 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 of what it is that I believe in. And that's enough. I'm not overly concerned about what other people are thinking about because, I mean, I used to watch Peter Jennings as a kid with my dad and Peter Jennings was reporting the news. And now Anderson Cooper and Tucker Carlson are creating the news. And it's like, if, any, if I want to listen to anyone create the news, it's going to be someone like Thomas Friedman. It's not going to be not going to be these guys. These guys aren't impressive um, whatsoever. So I'm stuck in the middle where I'm into the truth. So if someone says, you know, on the right, say this, and I'm like, yeah, that's true. I'm for that. If someone on the left says something that's true, then I'm for that. Then I'm looking for the truth. I'm not really looking to be a part of a team or a part of a side, but we need to understand like so much of our brain complements that and being accepted due to survival because if we were kicked out of the tribe a long time ago we we're probably going to go extinct that part of our brain is still incredibly powerful um sure we have you know we have phones we have technological advancements 
But emotionally, we're not any further ahead than we were when we were cavemen. I think that's pretty obvious. If you look at Ukraine, you just look at everything. It's we, we haven't really evolved um, our emotional intelligence uh, whatsoever. But did they have podcasts back in the caveman days? I think not. We've come. We've made a few strides. Yeah. Well, this has given us an ability to like share this with someone. And then there's a podcast probably happening in my neighborhood right now. And everyone's part of QAnon. And uh, yeah, and, and that's podcast too. <laughs> Good point. Um, may, may I note the uh, extreme beauty? Oh, it just disappeared. Did you all note the – Jeff can't see it, but behind him, above his guitar. Jeff, is it possible that there would be a palm tree that would create shade that would be on the on the back wall of your – right over your guitar a little while ago? That is a blind – uh, there would be. It's not a palm tree. We don't have palm trees in Australia. They're not indigenous <laughs> to Australia. It's some sort of eucalyptus, I think, blowing around in the wind. It's very windy in Melbourne at the moment. Oh, very neat. Well, that's good because um, you need to dry out those golf courses, don't you? <laughs> but this is actually this chat. It's very like when you meet Sean in the locker room on tour. This is where you end up when you're having your coffee in the morning. You start talking about, "Hey, you're hitting it, Jeff." Uh, this is where we end. <laughs> this is where, where we end up. Yeah. Okay. This is- How are you hitting it, Jeff? No, no, no. We end up with uh, we end up in a direction like that. But yeah, it's always fascinating. The best part, I think, if we get back to golf a little bit, there's swing teachers and there's coaches. And I think in the last thirty minutes, we've worked out that Sean is a coach. Um, he fell, fell, probably fell in love with the golf swing and like obsesses about the golf swing. But he's more about making people better golfers and better people. Um, and I think that the elite coaches that get to the top, the ones you see wandering around in the range on tour are the coaches, not the swing teachers. The swing teachers, I mean, Instagram is full of swing teachers, like you mentioned. There's not a lot of coaches, you know. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I think not to undermine all the swing talk, I think swing talk is amazing, but I feel like if I swung it like Cameron Champ, I would have won about 20 majors, you know what I mean? There's so much more to it than how you hit the ball and how easy it is for you to hit the ball. I mean, it's it's about playing the game and understand, like Sean said about how far the ball goes when it's 52 degrees. I don't know how far it goes when it's 52 degrees, but I know when I'm standing there and I feel it, my wedge is going to go 129 today. It's not going to go 135 because it's a bit cooler this morning. You know, these are just, and there's an infinite number of those things in golf um, that just come along as you play and experience if your eyes are open. And I think uh, Sean's one of those coaches who, gets his players' eyes open to all those little things and how they learn to become better players. They might move the club better and Brandall and all that will break it down on the Golf Channel and say, well, he's shallowing his path a bit more. And geez, doesn't he use the ground well? And is he hitting the ball better now that he's working with Sean? But that's probably not why he's really scoring better. He's scoring better because he's viewing golf in a more sort of holistic way. And um, Well, that's the one thing like you and I will know because we know a lot of the people in the game and – you know, you would listen to commentators or the guys after, and I know they're just doing their job. That's what their job is. Um, is like a guy will be struggling and they'll be ripping a swing, but you and I both know that his dad's just been diagnosed with leukemia or this guy's going through a divorce or, 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 or. And so that's just the, that's just the human element. I mean, I get the thing is the last few years from Danny Willett to Lydia Co kind of started with Tiger, uh, Michael Kim, who's back on tour now. Like these were people were all number, like Michael Kim was number one ranked amateur in the world and made 15 of his last 95 PGA tour cuts. So because I've been at it for a long time and then what I've been learning about the brain for the last two years, I've studied everything I can on it. It's really like most of it. I can't even understand the words, but Michael Kim was number one amateur in the world and he was kind of flat in his backswing, swung out to the right, flipped it, the word flip, he flipped it and hit more fairways and more greens than anyone in college. Then got on tour and was convinced like to be a great player, he needed to be able to hit a fade. And that was pretty much game over right there. Um, And I think someone like a DJ who came out with a sizable push draw, like really slung it, He took around 15 years to become a, like a good fader of the golf ball. And he took his time with it and took his time with it and took his time with it. Um, Tiger, when we worked, we had a little bit of a fade and some days he would wake up and he just couldn't fade it. 
So he would play with what he had and come back and work on it after, whereas so many guys are still trying to fix it on the first five holes. Then they're three over through five, and then they go, oh, shit, and they panic. And then they just get back in a survivor mode and shoot like even par. I mean, you're in survivor mode off the first tee. So it's, I think that's the, the, the tricky part is like, when I saw Hunter Mahan for the first time, I'd never seen anybody get as opened up as he was in right side bend to the ground so much. But then I watched him hit it and I was like, wow, that's incredible. I mean, Jeff, remember those years where the guy didn't miss... He was the most incredible driver of a golf ball I've ever seen. Now, what we noticed is for his wedge play, and when he was in the rough, that didn't really work as well. So when he got in the rough, we didn't like change his whole swing to make him better in the rough. We'd get closer to it. We'd cup it and take it more upright like a bunker shot and chop down on it. And I think that, that you know, that's kind of what happens to players. They think, well, man, you know, John Rom fades it, more a cow fades it, but I draw it. and you know, we need to do that. Well, we're not sure if John Rom or Colin Morikawa will end up uh, with as many tour wins or majors as Zach Johnson. We don't know that yet, right? So the Hall of Fame is full of guys who no one would have emulated. But when they came into impact, they weren't doing incredibly different things. Their glutes weren't doing incredibly different things. Their tricep wasn't doing incredibly different things. No one had the club in front of them. The club always looked behind them. So. It's, I think when you have, like the golf swing's quite easy for me. It's just the golfer that's really difficult. And I don't know how to say it better than that. I find the swing is give me 10 minutes with anyone who comes to see me and they will say, wow, within 10 minutes. Cause it's quite, I've been at it forever and I've been around a lot of smart people and I made a lot of, I fucked up a million times. And so all those kind of cardinal sins that I've created, they're kind of gone. I'm still going to make mistakes. But most of that just become when I'm lazy and I don't want to be there. So, and, and players get like that too. I mean, people can't imagine, but guys are on their fourth week in a row. Just trying to keep them like connected to the thing is really important because they're done. The last thing they want to do is see another golf ball. And my buddies that I play men's game with could never understand how you're fortunate enough to have a career like being on the PGA Tour and you wouldn't want to play, but that's because they don't get it yet. They, they would if they played four weeks in a row on three different continents. Meanwhile, their kids are at home growing up. They're not there. The kids are pissing off their mom. The mom is now upset at dad. And then you got to go and try to be a psych, like a sociopath and push. Some can do it. Most can't. And so to me, I think when you see a guy doing really, really well, then you look at all the things around them. There's this beautiful kind of coherence where everything fits into place. And unfortunately, because we don't have any control of anything outside of ourselves, And I'm not even sure how much we can control that, to be honest with you. Um, you know, there's a lot of moving parts to success and many of them we have no real control of. So it's kind of this, this kind of like this beautiful symphony of working smart and trusting the people you're around with and just punching the clock and then clocking out and then just waiting and then just waiting. Right. Um, like Jeff is a U.S. Open champion. He had his up and down was absolutely sick, but also one of the best mid iron players of his generation had to absolutely fat a seven iron from the middle of the fairway, which he doesn't really do. So there's so many things that go, that go into that. Like unless you win by a seven as you're one putting, someone else is three putting as, as you hit it, you know, too hard with a chip and it hits the pin and stops. Someone else says hit a better chip and it's lipped out. Like there's so many things happening. Like when you look at shot tracker with the final three groups, it's fascinating. Like how much things are moving and changing and moving and changing. So unless you're Tiger Woods and you're winning by seven or eight, um, if you're winning by one, then there's a lot of things you went that that went your way, and if you're losing by one, there's a lot of things that went your way as well. But I think at that top level, no one is just that much better than anybody else. Um, I mean, how many how many great golf shots that have ruined guys' careers just came down to the fact that they hit at a second when the wind was 17, and when the ball was in the middle of its arc, it gusted from 17 to 23, plugged in the front lip, and they made double. 
and lost the tournament and then sat there and thought about how did I lose it? And then the caddy goes, hey, I think this is what I'm seeing. The coach goes, this is what I'm seeing. The next sports psych says, wow, you know, he was bullied as a kid. And that's kind of interesting. That trauma is really difficult with that. And then next thing you know, <laughs> next thing you know the, player, the player can't remember what they thought in the first place. And so I'm, I'm like very, very incredibly careful with that. And I want to know, you don't, you don't teach Jeff Ogilvie or Justin Rose. Um, you just don't teach them. You teach my mom. She's a 20 handicap. She doesn't know how to do certain things. I think you coach them and I think it's really difficult for people to see themselves. Like I was with Ben on this morning and I just made the joke to Ben. Like if I had to talk about your alignment and your club face every single day, every time I had to mention it, if I charge you a thousand dollars, I'd have 200 grand before the season starts. And he goes, yeah. And if I got tired of paying you, you'd have another 200 grand because I'd win 4 million. <laughs> so like, like he admitted it. He's like, well, you're here. Why would I think? So it's, you just have to know, like other coaches would be like, dude, why do they get like this? And I'm like, I stopped trying to answer that. Like within the first two months I was on tour and just accepted it and then just did my job and just dealt with it. Like, you know, it's like some, it, it would be like a Lieutenant in the trenches in world war two going, why are they shooting at us? It's like, it doesn't matter why they are shooting at us. So keep your head down. <laughs> what is your best Tiger Woods story? Oh, they, I have some really good ones. Like, and some of them are about kind of him as a person, like how everyone's kind of come to see him now. I, I saw him quite often like that. It's just, he had to put up an incredible, an incredible wall. I mean, just a survival mechanism to block everything out, uh, including almost empathy sometimes. Um, hmm. I think it's a real thing, like, especially when you're a goat, like whether you're Prince or Michael Jackson or Tiger or Michael Jordan, or, I mean, you know, when your yacht's called privacy, like when you got to spend a hundred million to have privacy, that's pretty difficult. That's pretty trippy. Right. So I remember Bo Van Pelt one time. I love Bo Van Pelt, by the way, me and me and Bo were on, he used to such a laser show. And then Mark Cheney was his caddy. And I love Mark Cheney as well. And, uh, we were on the range and, uh, and I, I said to a tiger, you're going to go sign those kids hats. And he goes, no, I'm good. I go, just go sign their hats, but no big deal. Right. And he goes to walk over to sign the hats. And you know, like the, the, the heavy green fences, all of a sudden everyone pushes. Next thing I know there's adults on top of kids. And, um, tiger looks back at me almost as like, uh, told you. And Bo Van Pelt goes, you know what I love? I said, what's that? He said, I love being able to make about $3.5 million a year and not even getting recognized in my own airport. And so that, that's a tremendous sacrifice that they pay. And I think, you know, how many people have we seen get to number one and then drop off quite quickly after that? Because you, you have to be into that whole thing in order to be able to deal with that. And so I don't think a lot of people want to do that. So next thing they know, they self-sabotage and all of that kind of unwanted stuff and stress goes away because the survivor is protecting the thriver from its own issue. So it's it like, it, th this is occurring, but my best tiger story ever, um, cause he's, he's quite humble. He doesn't really brag on himself or anything like that. And we're at Akron in 2013 and he's already kicked me off the range when he got back to number one, he said, I want you on the range after the round and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but never in my warm up." And I just said, yeah, fine, bro. Don't. He's like, don't take it personally. I'm like, no, no, I don't. I don't. Um, no, no, no worries. Right. Like you're good. And so I used to sit with I had Rosie and Hunter and O'Hare. I would sit and wait for them or be on the range with him while he was warming up. So at, at Firestone, like Jeff knows there's that wall that separates the putting green from the driving range. So I would just sit on the wall, watch him warm up. And uh, he's, he's warming up this day. And they, two days before that, I showed him a video. He goes, do you like that? And I'm like, I mean, yeah, I like how you're hitting it. And you just won four out of your last six tournaments. So yeah, I like it. Um, but I'd like it a little more lined up if you're asking. He goes, well, that's all right, because it feels amazing. And I was like, oh, shit, he just got me, right? Like he got me. And so I'm sitting on the wall 
and I'm watching this warm up and it's it's like a next level warm up but remember I've been seeing Hunter and Justin Rose and Sean O'Hare who are no spring chickens when it comes to warm ups and so I really know what like a high level is but his is a bit different because I can see where he's aiming and he's hitting draws and fades that are all starting equally right and left and landing in the same place. And then he hits a couple of long irons just straight up in the air, like a Jeff Ogilvy three iron. And then um, he hits these couple stinger three woods and then does whatever he wants with the driver. And he walks up to me and says, you, are you going to, are you going to stick around and watch? And Friday afternoon I leave to come home to be with my family. And I said, dude, it's Friday. What do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to go to the airport. And he winked at me and said, I think you should stick around. And he never said anything like that ever. And so I'm like, all right, that was weird. So whatever, get in my car, went to the house in Akron, got my stuff, went to the uh, airport. And, you know, it's traditional for a Canadian on Friday at 2.30 to open his first beer. So that's what happened. And I'm sitting in that little bar there in, uh, in, in Akron, Canton. And the guy puts the golf on and I go like this and I look and Tiger's nine under through 10. And so he knew teeing off that he was going to be an absolute, it was going to be an absolute clinic and then wanted me to stick around to watch it. But being five foot six, I couldn't see a single shot anyways. If you're going to coach Tiger, you got to be about seven feet. Uh, Chris Como had the same problem. He's like, how do you see? I go, you don't, you can't. But they show every shot on television. So just go video. I'd be in the locker room filming filming the screen. And it's funny because I've yet to take a video of one of my players in contention on my phone that looks like the swing they had just leaving to go to the golf course. There's already there's always these slightly different uh, little nuances to it. But uh, that that's probably for me is like my coolest Tiger story is just not many people can say, hey, today I'm going to shoot 59. Um, I think most of the time when guys do, they're thinking of withdrawing because they're hitting it so shit on the range. So they kind of quit, call their agent on the way to the tee and say, is there a NetJets flat flight you know, tonight? Next thing you know, they're 10 under through 11. <laughs> That's Alan, awesome. our, our, our guest has unique sensibilities. I know we don't have that much time, but can we try a lightning round? <laughs> there's, there's no rules. There's no rules here at Need a Fourth. This is a nutty question, and I've wanted to ask you this for a long time. If there had never been rule changes, Tiger's just old enough that he started with wooden woods and blotted balls and steel shafts. Let's say the rules never changed, and that was the equipment he would have played, and everybody else would have played too. How many career majors to, to date, and um, and how many wins? Mm. Yeah, I think also if you add, if he never, ever got coached, I think you have to add that, right? Um, you, you, you're, you're, your game, you any rules you like. I'm adding one more thing. I think if we had strokes gained off the tee now, in 99 to 2001, he would have realized that it wasn't helpful at all to hit more fairways as far as he hit it. So I'm just saying that. So I think we could be in the maybe the mid-30s. For, for majors. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, go ahead, Sean. Yeah, yeah. For, yeah. For, for majors, I think the technology, it didn't help. It didn't help him. It helped other players get slightly better, which still wasn't good enough to get to him. But he always played with a lot of curve. And as soon as the ball started changing, he couldn't be as creative as he used to be. So, um, yeah, I would, I would probably say like mid, probably mid thirties. He would have had way less injuries. Um, Why is that? Yeah, I would say mid thirties. Why would he have fewer injuries? Just wouldn't have been swinging as hard. No, not really. He used to swing faster when he was 140 pounds than when he was 200 pounds. I mean, Jeff saw it early on. He remembers what it was like. I mean, he was obviously strong and athletic and, and fast. But I mean, when you watch 97 Masters, like I know that he's weren't as far back as they are now, but long players were hitting six iron into 11. He was flipping pitching wedge onto that, onto that green. Oh, oh yeah. I think he pitching wedge into 13. Yeah, I've seen he hit pitching wedge into 15. Last year, Cameron Champ hit a gap wedge into two. Uh, we're not very good at hitting it high, but when he tries to hit Did it you high, see Ogilvy? Did you see Ogilvy there? <laughs> out of his chair. I'm yeah. happy to get it over the hill on two. Hey, Jeff, we hit it over the back and barely made five. Just saying, okay? Yeah. Well, we, yeah. So, so, look, when you're able to hit it that far, 
you're not the best at hitting the stricker wedge for the record. Okay. Like Usain Bolt would not, would take a long time to be a good 800 runner because he would come in and say, coach, how was that? I'd be like, dude, the first hundred was too fast. Really? I just felt like I wasn't even trying. It's just because he's fast. That's what he is. Right. So it's a, a, a leopard doesn't have stripes. Right. So it takes a lot of work to, to get, you know, to get the better at that. But I think Tiger would have been easily in the, in the thirties. I mean, the amount of time that he took to change his swing. Um, that took a lot of time off his ability to play well. No, Alan, please pardon me, but Sean, if you just follow up there, does it ever come up in his conversation? Does he ever say, man, if they'd never changed the equipment, look what I could have done. I know he's humble by nature, but does it ever come up? He just, he will never bitch or complain ever. I've never heard him talk about slow play. I've never heard him anything like that. And I let everyone I know who bitch about every bad club their caddy picks, which is blows my mind that you're a world-class player and you think it's seven and he thinks it's six and you go with him. Uh, like how could anyone know more than you that it's a seven iron? Okay. And so then people on tour will say, well, fall on the sword because you don't want him to lose his confidence. And it's like, no, but he's competently making mistakes five times around. So He's confidently still making bogeys. Who get, so I'm 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 kind of Hunter said it the best. Hunter said Sean his coaching is he gives you the best hug you've ever got or kicks you in the balls harder than you've ever been kicked because look I'm out there to I'm out there to make a living and so I make a percentage of what they earn and so when I see them have two bad putting weeks and change the putter they've been using for two years they're going to get murdered on that one because I've seen that before. So when I've never heard Tiger ever yell the caddy, I've never heard him ever complain about anything, nothing. And then he is literally the goat because he took more ownership and responsibility than anyone who's ever played. And then Jack Nicholas is a very close second because I kind of interviewed Jack over lunch and Memorial. And he was the one who brought up the idea when I was like, what did you want from a caddy? Because a lot of times I'm the conduit in between the player and the caddy. I got to, talk to both of them after the round. It's amazing. Sometimes it's like, were you guys even together today? Like, <laughs> and, and that just goes to show you, right? Like if you're in a good mood and they say your flight's delayed, you're like, all right, what's my options? If you're in a bad mood and they tell you that uh, they've had to move your seat because someone else had a higher upgrade, you lose your shit. And you know what I mean? So it's, you got to know that everyone is seeing things through the lens of where they're at at that moment. So. If someone's in a good mood, then yeah, today was good. Felt really good about it. And the caddy's sitting there going. So it's, it's really quite fascinating. Those calls are fascinating. Very rarely are they ever on the same page because we just, no one's ever in the same state of mind at the same time. It, it just constantly keeps, uh, keeps flowing. Um, but yeah, the, the amount of creativity that he had and how he shaped the ball you know, I say like, it's not a lost art now, people being able to hit shots into a right pin. Technology is making it really difficult to get the ball into a right pin by holding it against the wind or fading it up to hold against the wind. Whereas Tour Balladas and the early Titleist Professional, you can still curve it a lot more. So, so you caught Tiger at a very unusual time when you guys started working together. I mean, it was, it was just coming after the you know, the, the scandal and he had, he was playing the greatest golf that's ever been played. And all of a sudden his life was turned upside down and you've, you know, he's, he's been through all the surgeries and the injuries and the car accident. I mean, it's been an incredible decade plus. I mean, what have you observed in him as evolution? Um, not as a player, we, we, we can see that, but all the other things and not that you've been working with him this whole time, but I know you guys are still close and you, you still, and you're still a close observer of Tiger. I mean, just talk about how it all changed once you started working together and, and where he is now in, in, in this journey. I, I mean, I can't really, I can't really speculate on what he was like before I met him, but I kind of walked into his life at a time when everyone was walking out. Um, and then right when we started working, Hank Haney wrote a book about him called The Big Miss. And so that fucking wasn't easy because then it was like, what separates me from doing the same thing? And I just said, well, just time. You'll see in time. I won't write a book about you. Um, 
if I do, it'll be like the things I learned from Tiger. I won't be ripping him because I learned a lot of. I was at that time I was coaching Tiger. He would teach me all these little things he'd do, and then I'd take him over to Rosie and Hunter and go, "Hey, this is how he flights it into the wind." They're like, "Oh man, that's interesting." So they we all got better. Okay? We I watch him flight it into the wind with no divot and go like, "How is he doing that?" And it stays so flat. And then he explained it. Not really in coaching terms. I had to kind of reverse engineer it, but um, those boys got a lot of tips from Tiger, whether or not they realize it. Um, yeah, look, he's a human being, right? And I mean, you know, he didn't. You want to look at troubled adults, then you just have to look at very, very rare, different childhoods. And, you know, we, I, I think that the way Tiger grew up, and it was just golf, golf, golf. And I don't even really think that it was really that much a function of Earl or I think his mom told me that he had to finish his homework before he went to the golf course. So he would do his homework during lunch, which made him look antisocial, but he just wanted to be at the golf course. He's not antisocial. Um, <coughs> you know, having 30,000 people on each hole and probably learning how to be able to get into a bubble and not really focus on anything else, you might look like you're not warm or you're being rude, but I think the people who are being rude are the people who want him to match what they think a good person does. So that's the difference with him and Phil, obviously, right? And as we, we learn about Phil, it's not, it's, not, it's not completely that genuine. My experiences with Phil over 16 years, uh, He's blown me away with what he's remembered about my family and things like that. So I think Phil is, is, is in that way. In my own experience, I don't think that he's a phony, but I also know about all the other stuff too. So, I mean, at the end of the day, people are running a business and they're building a brand and brand is based on image and image comes from uh, uh, the Greek word. I think it's image, which means imagine, which is also a synonym for illusion. So most people's image is just an illusion anyways, right? It's what they're perpetuating for you to see. But we don't really get to sit and have dinner with people and watch how they treat their kids or how they treat strangers or how they react to a homeless person. So I think on a PGA Tour, because it's such a five-minute relationship, like Jeff was saying, hey, how you doing, mate? Boom, 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 boom. It's a five-minute talk. So I think as time goes on, like all these relationships are so honeymoon-based that everything seems pretty kosher and everything's cool. But once you spend way more time around someone, you start realizing, oh, okay, I didn't, need, I didn't see that before. So I just think Tiger is a human being who's had a, 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 a fantastic but a very difficult life. And uh, he succumbed to stardom and fame like every other star who's that famous did. Like they all went, they all ended up kind of in the same place, right? Um, is there, I don't know about Messi. But is there even a goat who's still married to their original? Federer. Fed. Jack. Jack. Yeah. Right? So, and I'm not sure if that's really an idea of being a goat, but, you know, guys get obsessed about this thing. And it's not like that they're, they just don't see it. They can't even, they don't even understand that it's there. It's just they're so focused all the time on this. Um, and that's the love of their life. And I think that that, I think that that's okay. But when we judge them against a value based monogamy based society, it's like we pigeonhole people like this is how you should live. That's how I should live to live my life in a way that I can look myself in the mirror and I can go to sleep. And, you know, if you ask me what success was 20 years ago, it would be, you know, big checks and major championships. And now it's kind of come down to like, when my head hits the pillow, I fall asleep quick. And then I wake up excited about going about my day. That to me is now success because I've done all that other stuff. And that really wasn't where I felt my best. But I feel my best when I'm inspiring people or when I'm reading or when I'm learning. Um, it doesn't really matter um, what's on the perception as far as trophies and checks and all that. So it's all about the climb. It's not really about the summit because... I mean, the summit basically is really cold and there's no fucking oxygen there. And nine out of 10 climbers die when they go down, not when they go up. So being at the summit's a pretty actually dangerous place to be when you think about it. <laughs> um, 
Well, I, I think you've you've inspired and educated us here. But I was making notes. We've had appearances from Nelson Mandela, Sir Isaac Newton, Gutenberg Twain, Tom Friedman, some ancient Greek, to say nothing of Ben Hogan and assorted other golfers. But uh, it's it's always fun wrapping out with you, Sean. We didn't even get to talk about hip hop, which I know is really the love of your life. We'll save that for the next one, the sequel. Um, before we let before we let um, our esteemed guests go, guys, you have any any parting thoughts um it looks sean yeah it's always fun to talk um i feel like i learn every time and i uh my swing's better now um (laughs) and uh you always make me want to go practice like i think if there's any gift that i think the best gift you have is you make me want you make me want to go practice and i think that's true of your players that you work with makes me want to go get better um, and that might be the most important thing. Hunter Mayhan was one of the greatest players I've ever seen. And then we stopped and now Hunter is just retired, right? It, a lot of things look mental when guys just lose their love for what they do. And, you know, love for the game of golf is so necessary. Just like love for your kids is so necessary because Half the time, if you didn't love your kids, you probably put a pillow over their head because, you know, they're not appreciative. You do all this for them. They don't love <laughs> So love is literally the key because golf in like life is going to be a struggle. So if you don't like love is basically that like when you fall off the cliff, love is kind of the pillows that 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 saves you from it. So I think what we look at a lot with players as something mental, I think it's more a function of their heart. And so if you can get players to, whenever I start with a player, I ask them like, why golf? Like, why do you play golf? And it's like half the time they're trying to say something they think I want to hear, but a lot of time they actually don't know. And so that's one of my first major tasks is to get them to kind of re-recognize why they play because most of us, well, all of us, we paid to play as kids and we loved it. And then we got paid to do it and we ended up fucking being miserable from it. And that just doesn't seem right. It just doesn't seem like, like how come I get so much joy when I work with these mini tour players who can't afford to take a lesson with me and I put two hours of time in and I leave like so gratified and like, man, this is amazing. And then my player finished second in the masters and I'm depressed for a month. It's like, that's not it. Like that's not right. Um, so to me, it's like, you know, keep the main thing about the main thing. So, you know, if you want to get in good shape, you got to work out and do cardio, but you also have to recover and you have to eat right. It's not just one thing. So it, to me, it's about the love. Like what Jeff's talking about is he's, he's not getting motivated because I can't motivate you. I can't get inside of you. This is not outside in. It's inside out. But, you know, is to inspire someone to... Look, if you can inspire Michael Kim to want to practice again, where it used to be so embarrassing to even hit balls while other people were hitting balls, and you get him out there and 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 he wants to be out there again and do it again, if I give him two years and I'll keep him on the I'll keep him on the right track, I'll put it like this. I shouldn't say that. I'll keep him off the wrong track. I don't I don't know what's really right for any other individual on the planet. I know what's right for me. But I know what's wrong for him. If I can keep him from doing that, then if he was the number one ranked amateur in the world again, we got to have three wins in us in the next two years. I wouldn't work with him if I didn't believe that he could do it. Um, there's the love of it, but there's the business part of it. So if I just worked with all the people that I loved, I'm not sure if I could just completely make a living. So it's about having the love for coaching. And that love for coaching was never golf digest rankings and being famous and having nice shit. Um, it wasn't about that. It was like the look on that kid's face there when he, he, he basically, this was funny, Jeff. I've never seen anyone do this before. And I almost pissed myself. He, he started hitting balls and he's very athletic and he, 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 he's won some tournaments last year so he can play. Um, and I said, man, you got no need for a three wood, bro. You, with, with your move, long irons and three woods don't even need to be in your bag. And he goes, that's why my three wood is turned upside down. So the three wood was grip, grip out. And so I said, well, look, if you can stretch your arms away from you and you can turn more, 
I think that you have a lot of speed, so you have a lot of lag. The lag is not the speed. The lag is the function that the arms are moving so fast that the club is lagging for longer. Okay, that's it. That's all it's doing. All right, you can't you can't speed a club up if you don't put a force into it to line up to what's swinging it. So I was like, man, if I can get his hands a little bit more in and get him to turn a little bit more, it'll give him more time to release the loft and we'll be golden. And he hits this three wood. I mean, he couldn't get it off the ground. And, he, you know, three woods are nasty clubs, Jeff. And he's kind of hitting these low skanky right shots. And he hits this three wood up in the air. And he was just so grateful to realize that he wasn't like an idiot and he didn't have this mental challenge with his three wood. I was like, no, bro, you just don't have time to release it. It ain't really based on the fact that you were picked on in high school. I promise you that it's not. <laughs> and I have empathy for that. But I mean, you know, there's a lot of people who, who survived the uh, Holocaust and went on to do unbelievable things with their life. So don't, I appreciate they probably had nightmares for the rest of their life, but you're not stuck in 10 years ago unless you put, unless you allow yourself to stay there. So just the look on his face, even though there's no payment at the end of the lesson, man, that's just, I love that. And I got to constantly remind myself that that's what I love about it. And it shouldn't matter if it's for a hundred grand or nothing. It should just be that interaction where you showed someone that they're really special. They just didn't know how to get to it. Um, that's really cool for me. Cause I think when you work with somebody like that, you also get to work on yourself. Cause I got all kinds of doubts too, about, about my skills and where I could be better. I'm just as critical of myself as no one on the golf channel could criticize me as much as I do. They probably tried, but they're not able to. So it's, it's all like, a you know, it's just, this, you know, my dad calls golf the beautiful struggle. And I think that it's like life. It's perfect that way. It's like, it is, it is a beautiful struggle. And you listen to Arnold Palmer, you know, his quote was that uh, golf is deceptively simple and endlessly complicated. And that was his philosophy. He didn't need a mental coach. Once, once he understood that as his truth, then when he was six under through seven, he probably thought, stay sharp here because it's probably about to get difficult. And when he played bad for two weeks in a row, he wasn't looking for searches or answers because he'd already recognized it was endlessly complicated. So we see a guy who walked around the course, you know, looked like he enjoyed himself, looked like he enjoyed the whole thing, didn't get that upset, got frustrated. But remember, frustration is part of success. Like if, if you don't get frustrated, oftentimes you're not going to get better. It's just aligned to how frustrated you get. And so here's a guy who knew that it was deceptively simple. And it was endlessly complicated. So when it was simple, it was lying to you. And it was typically complicated. So of course, he was never surprised when he played bad because he'd already accepted that that was the name of the game. That, I mean, that's just perfect, right? Like, that's just perfect. I love that. Um, all right. Well, so we have a tradition here on uh, Nita Fourth. Um we like to we like to do a little Monday morning quarterbacking of our guests. So, Sean, you've been amazingly generous with your time and your insight, and this was an absolute pleasure. You click the little red phone on your screen, you leave, and then we're going to talk about you. Like it's high school and it's recess, and we're going to whisper <laughs> about you. But I suspect it'll be mostly good things. But um, anyway, yes, well, I. And so, just to get it straight, I'm five six. I'm not five foot four. Okay, so that <laughs> got it. Don't. don't uh, don't, I'm so proud of Messi. I think he's the only goat ever who's five foot six. So way to go, Messi. Uh, <laughs> we'll this, this writing itself, but just one last thing. You look at Ronaldo and you look at Messi. Ronaldo probably should have been a pro golfer, right? And so he wasn't working well with his team at all. And you could tell it. I mean, they didn't even start him. And then these guys on Argentina are playing a higher level than they've ever played because they are inspired to do this for Messi. I mean... They're wearing the hat with number 10 on it. And so they're playing with their hero and they're coming like they're playing at a level that they just haven't really played at historically because of the love they have for Messi and how inspired they are. So it's incredible that when people are inspired, what they can do. And when people have like, you know, I read this book called The Happiness Project and it made me giggle because one, I don't think happiness is a correlation of success anyways but 
nowhere did it talk about purpose or meaning at all. And so I think one of the things that I use with my players, I, I stole it from Viktor Frankl from Man's Search for Meaning and obviously chapter one. And anyone who haven't read Man's Search for Meaning, just please like get it on Amazon for six bucks right now. It's two chapters, but the first chapter for me was life changing. And I use it a lot with people. And, you know, he had understood, obviously, as a psychiatrist who uh, was taken in the concentration camp as a Jewish prisoner. Imagine being a psychiatrist in a concentration camp. I mean, talk about the ultimate environment for learning human behavior and survival. And he talks in the book about, you know, so many of the prisoners who should have been dead like a year ago, but what kept them alive was just the image of their wife and their kids. And so they had typhus, they had all these things, they worked through negative 20 days with no shoes on, just incredible torment and suffering. And as soon as they found out that their family uh, had been exterminated, they died within 30 seconds. And I think, you know, you can look at couples who've been married for 60 years and either the husband or the wife dies. And within a month, the other one who was completely healthy is dead too. And I think that that speaks to purpose and meaning. So if you can have a purpose that's that big and normally for human beings, it's not ourselves. It's something, it's something else. Um, I think if you live a purpose driven existence, then that's kind of, you know, when you're on the high seas and there's a massive storm, you got two things. You got a light to let you know you're going the right direction. And if it gets really bad, you have an anchor. And regardless of how the boat feels like it's going, as long as it's anchored in, it's not going to turn over. And then we all have to know that that storm isn't going to last for two weeks. At worst, it's going to be four or five days. So I think having purpose and meaning and then having love for what you do it's what allows you to keep going when things get so hard. Because when things get going easy, you don't really need... I mean, I haven't learned anything on vacation ever in my whole life. Um, but it's, you know, when my players are going through it, it's trying to get them to understand, like, this thing that you're trying, like, this adversity you're going through is literally giving you a PhD if you're willing to accept it and understand it. It's teaching you that you don't understand something. So. Stop changing drivers, stop changing wedges, stop changing putters, stop changing caddies. None of those things are the reason you were ever great anyways. So it's, uh, anyways, I'll leave it at that. That's awesome. I love it. All right. Well, Sean, thank you again. Always a pleasure. Um, Good to see you guys, Michael. Sean. Thanks, pleasure. Sean. Jeff, my man, we'll see when, when do we see you again? I'm coming over. I'll be there this year a little bit. You'll see me next year. You're going to play? Yeah. What, Where they let me. You got any new events coming up? Like what um, would be your next event? Over there. Well, we got the Sandbelt Invitational um, in Australia, but I'm going to play Pebble, I think. Maybe. Maybe. Nice. I'm going to try to play a few next year. Yeah, we'll see. Alan's all right, good, good. Yeah, we'll see. Right. It's more fun being a golfer. I've tried all these other things. It's Golf is still the best job I've ever had. <laughs> That's good stuff. Thanks, all right. Sean. Hey boys, thank you, thank you, Sean. Done, Dale. Well, that was some fascinating shit. I mean, Sean Foley is really a unique guy, and he's not even fifty years old. I mean, he's, he's been out there a long time. There's a lot of golf in front of him. It's, uh, I obviously he's passionate. He's quite intelligent, but I just I just love his perspective on everything. I, I thought that was a really cool conversation. Yeah, I enjoyed it. He always, he always, as I said, when you go for a coffee on tour. Um, and Sean's there in the locker room and you start, it's it's like that. You end up at somewhere completely where you didn't think you were going to be, but when you connect all the dots, that's actually where it all begins. You know, he does seem to look for the root cause of everything. You know, and, and all Jeff, about hitting and a draw, but he, start, he ends up in a concentration camp. But you, all I wanted to do was how to hit a draw with a step on, you know. Like it's, um, it's fascinating, yeah. Jeff, in, in a locker room setting, um, what's the percentage uh, Sean talking versus you talking? Similar to this podcast, probably. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. We've had some great chats uh, in rain delays and stuff. Yeah, we. Uh, he's a really interesting guy. And there's something about Canadians and Australians 
must be the Commonwealth thing or something. We There's some sort of weird, we just see the world a very similar way and it's the same with all the Canadians I've ever chatted to and he's certainly, as I said, he loves a chat and he loves going into it and I like going into it. So he's always been, I've always loved bumping into him. That's great. That's great stuff. Well, this has been another unexpected and eclectic uh, need a fourth, which is kind of our mandate. There's a lot of golf podcasts. We want to, you don't want to just talk about seven irons, although they are interesting, but, um, uh, so anyway, well, you know, what Dave, Alan, you know what DiVincenzo said about the seven iron and it very much relates to this conversation. It is my professor. <laughs> I love that. My, my favorite DiVincenzo bit of advice is to the young Sevi. Do, do you know this bit? He says, you must be able to eat any cuisine. You must be able to sleep in any bed. And you must be able to make love to any woman, but not so well she'll want to follow you. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. For all the young aspiring golfers out there, write that down. You're going to need that. Um, anyway, all right. This is Nita Fourth. We will be back at it again. Uh, we have some great guests who we've already taped them. We have others we're, we're trying to lasso, but uh, this, is, this is an ongoing project we're having a lot of fun with. Hopefully you are too listening at home uh, or in your car or in the gym. So for uh, Jeff Ogilvy and Michael Bamberger, I'm Alan Shipnuck. Thank you for listening and we'll do it again soon. Oh my God, there's a dangerous group here. <laughs>